Welcome to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Raban, and we have a fantastic episode for you. We have your Q&A, question and answer, your favorite, probably some of your favorite episodes, because they're episodes brought by you. That is, these are your questions, and we're going to answer them. And as always, Maria, my trusty producer, is with us. We were arguing about... Uh, my attire. Her attire. I said, God, I, I feel overdressed at the party. She's like, I'm a producer. What do you mean? I'm a producer. Okay, anyway. Yeah. So Maria has put together a, um, I have to say, just as I was talking to you, I was saying the questions are getting better and better and better. You guys are incredibly well educated. And I really have enjoyed the questions because historically back when we first started, they'd be like a hundred questions and mm -hmm. we'd have, I'd only be able to like go through like five of them because mm -hmm. they were just silly and not appropriate. And now mm -hmm. they're so right on the money. Like if I were to make questions, these would be them. So you guys are doing a great job. Well, I want to start off with, uh, we got a review uh, on our podcast. We got a review. Is it a good one? A good one. It's okay, called yeah. What a Gift. What okay? a Gift. All right, good. And it I comes... like, if it sucks, I don't, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No, but we've never gotten a bad review. I okay, can well. tell you. We got this from Lush Key, and she basically, or he or she says, this podcast is a free gift, the gift of knowledge. This podcast has equipped me to make wiser choices and helped me cut through a lot of the noise that surrounds plastic surgery. Thank you for making plastic surgery more transparent to the general public. Making podcasts is time consuming. Uh, yes, it is. That it is. But you do it for us and we love you for it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, we It makes us happy to hear those things because it is time consuming. Mm -hmm. And we do do it so that um, there's some transparency. And really the ultimate goal is for there to be information for you that is, as you said, um, cuts through all the BS and gets you to the point that you need to know so you can make good choices wherever you decide to do it, whatever you decide to do. So that was lovely. All right, what's the okay. first question? So these topics are about abdomen. So we've gone mm -hmm. kind of tried to cluster them together into um, categories or concepts, um, and this is about abdomens, tummies, and lipo, and, and things of that nature. It makes right? it easier for me to write a description. <laughs> All right, so that's why we do it. All right, what, so what's okay. the first question? Okay, this one comes from Megan and Jeff underscore zero nine. Megan and Jeff underscore zero nine. What can I do to manage swelling after a tummy tuck? So what can I do to manage swelling after a tummy tuck? The answer is nothing. You need to just give it time. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it's a whole industry. There's a whole industry revolving around accelerating swelling, which is like lymphatic massages and this. That's, I am not a believer of lymphatic massage. I not only am I not a believer, I forbid my patients from doing lymphatic massage, especially maybe, I don't know, people do BBLs and all this other stuff, which I don't do. But like for an abdominoplasty where there's hundreds of sutures in there, you don't want someone cranking away with some roller. The body has a normal process. The body will get you where you need to go. You must be patient. Mm -hmm. It's an abdominoplasty. It's a tummy tuck. We cut you in half. Mm -hmm. you, you can't expect at eight weeks that you're going to be like, you know, without swelling. That's not going to happen if you had your teeth pulled. That's not going to happen if you had a, 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 a gallbladder removed. That's not going to happen after a hysterectomy. It's just not how humans are. At six weeks, we tell you to go start exercising. You're not going to be swelling free for three to six months. And even then, I tell you, realistically, the body needs a good 12 to 18 months. So the answer is don't do anything. Just be patient. But I think that this idea or notion that you could somehow do some magic something, and it's usually some kind of massage, I think it's a mistake. Okay, so uh, this question comes from Patty Grease. Patty Grease. Mm -hmm. Or Grice. Grice Patty Grease or be. Grice. Mm -hmm. Do you always lipo the flanks or not necessary when doing a tummy tuck? So it's a great question. So if you were tomorrow get up and you were to go do five consults with five different plastic surgeons regarding abdomens, like I've had three kids, I've had two kids, I had a set of twins, whatever, I lost a ton of weight. All five of them, they're going to tell you you need a tummy tuck with lipo. Because a tummy tuck and lipo, like one of my other ones that I said, you need a brow lift with an eyelid or like this combo, like in other words, without the liposuction, you're not going to get the curvy waist. In other words, a tummy tuck is for flattening your abdomen, but the lipo makes you curvy. Eh, that's not correct. If you go onto my gallery, 90% of my patients have not had liposuction. Liposuction doesn't make you curvy. Liposuction gets rid of 
uh, stubborn fat that may have been there and you need to have a lot of it for me to remove it. What makes you curvy is repair of the muscles in the midline. So let's say tomorrow you had to go to a big event, a gala, and I gave you this really skimpy dress that you had to fit in, kind of like a Jessica Rabbit kind of a dress, nice small waist. You're gonna wear a corset. You're gonna wear an old fashioned and pull your, and the corset, if you notice, ties in the middle. And what it does is it sucks in your abdomen. So in essence, when I am doing my aggressive muscle repair, I am cinching your muscles, thereby bringing your square hips in. So I'm not using liposuction to do that. And when you use it to do that, you're very aggressive and you create sort of weird dents and divots and also create loose skin. So to answer your question, I do do liposuction with tummy tuck very infrequently. And the reason I do it is to get rid of some of the excess love handle, not to create a curvy waist. Wow. You know, in uh, Latinas tend to wear these really Fajas. tight, but they're like, yeah. they cinch at the waist and then they have, they say that when you wear these girdles, you get this like curvy, like the little waist. And I think I've seen a difference in some women that wear those. No, it's, it's kind of, well, let's put it this way. Have you seen uh, the, the people in China mm -hmm. that wear the tiny shoes? Uh -huh. You've seen it, right? What yeah. they do is they start to get smaller and smaller and smaller shoe. I don't, I don't know the full cultural effects of it, but literally like you fit all of their toes into like a pinhole. And if you keep wearing something over and over and over and over again, you will start to redirect bones and ribs and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But at what cost? You have all your organs in there. And essentially you're trying to force everything into a small, I, I just think. I just think you're doing some danger inside. You, I, you, I just, you, you are. But I do notice a, a difference in some women. Okay, or it, it's maybe that they have the fajas on. They do. Okay, so the next one comes from Vanny, Vanny 3M. Vanny 3M. Is blood thinner injections helpful in preventing and reducing chances of blood clots after tummy tucks? Wonderful question. So blood clots, DVTs, a blood clot or deep venous thrombosis often occurs behind the knees or in the thighs or in the groin. That blood clot can then break off and shoot to the heart and lungs and give you a pulmonary embolus. That can be fatal. So that's what we're talking about. Post-surgery, orthopedic surgery, baby delivery, plastic surgery, you can get a DVT or a blood clot, which can then later create a pulmonary embolus. Certain surgeries are more at risk than others. You get a rhinoplasty, the risk of a DVT or a blood clot and a PE are much lesser than when you get a tummy tuck. The reason tummy tucks are at higher rate is we tend to A, create a lot of inflammation, more inflammation in the blood, but mostly because you're bent at the hips, you're flexed, and you tend to get blood clots in are uh, veins that are flexed. So in general, so here's the, the skinny. In general, what most surgeons do to reduce blood clots is A, when you go to sleep in the operating room, they put these squeezy things on your leg called leg squeezers. They're compression stockings. Oh, and the reason they use them is because when they give you the anesthetic drugs to put you to sleep, your veins dilate and blood pools and may stay, may stay stagnant for minutes or, you know, and you could create a clot. So they use the leg squeezers to continue circulating. That's one. The other thing that they do is we have patients ambulate or walk very quickly after surgery. You get a tummy tuck, you're walking out of the surgery center and into the car and in the car into your house. And while we don't ask you to go for walks, we are having you walk around. We do not want you laying in bed for four days because being stagnant increases the rate. And that's what 99% of plastic surgeons do. I add to that blood thinners at the time of your surgery. So I give you a blood thinner, heparin, at the time of your surgery with tummy tucks and those larger cases, in an effort to thin out your blood to reduce the likelihood that you will get a DVT or a, uh, um, a blood clot. You can then add to that, and depending on how high a risk you are, you can then, in addition, take blood thinners at home. I generally don't use any blood thinners once you've left because you're walking and moving. 
If you're stagnant or stay home because you had an injury or a car accident or whatever, then it's not a bad idea. But in general, I do use blood thinners during the time of surgeries, which most surgeons don't. Mm -hmm. The reason being is they're afraid that it's going to cause you to bleed from a tummy tuck. But there is no science that says that that dose does cause bleeding. So I use it all the time routinely. Okay. Next question comes from Mariposa underscore San Diego. Oh, Mariposa butterfly. Yeah. If you... If you had a hernia repair in the past, can you still get a tummy tuck? Is it safe to get one? So um, let's back up here. In general, I prefer you don't have your belly button hernia or your midline hernias corrected because you usually go, you see a doctor. If you're postpartum, that means you've had a bunch of kids, you have diastasis, muscle separation, and then they go and do some repair of your hernia and then your hernia comes back because what they're doing is they're putting a piece of plastic or mesh on an area that's already weak. When I, for, when I do all my tummy tucks, every single case, I always correct your hernias while I'm there without any foreign material because what I'm doing is I'm repairing the hernia, that's the hole, shoving the material back in and then repairing the muscles back together in two layers. That two layer closure represents the reinforcement that a piece of plastic or mesh would do. That's ideal. Now you come to me and be like, Hey, two years ago, a year ago, five years ago, I had a hernia repaired and now I, you know, it's back and, or it's not back, but I want a tummy tuck. The answer is I can do a tummy tuck and I have done many in which case I either have either try to remove that foreign material, which we call mesh, or I have to bury it under the muscle repair. It's mm. not my preference, but certainly it can be done and it can be done safely. Okay. Doc. Next question comes from Megan dot Mitchell. Megan dot Mitchell. Is there a non-surgical tightening for loose skin from weight loss? All right. The question, I want everyone to listen to the question again. Is there a non-surgical tightening for loose skin? from weight loss. Did you hear that? And the answer is absolutely not. No. no way, no how, impossible, pie in the sky, hell no. Because if there was, I would have whatever device there is, I would buy 15 of them. I would have one in every room. I would have a nurse or a provider and I would go home and spend time with my kids and my wife on a yacht. There is no such device that tightens anything anywhere. Not the face, not the this, not the that. That's all nonsense. I don't know, maybe in 10 years, maybe in five years, maybe in a year, but I can assure you none of the devices currently who claim to tighten anything tighten it, especially the degree of loose skin that we're talking about after weight loss. So the answer is once you have loose skin in your arms, in your neck, in your belly, in your thighs, you either live with it or you cut it out, you mm -hmm. remove it, you get a tummy tuck, you get a neck lift, you get an eyelid. You cannot remove loose skin by some mm -hmm. Mickey Mouse device. So no. And if anyone tells you otherwise, they're lying to you. You want to take a break? Yep. How many more do we have? We have some more. Okay. Should we take a break? Let's take a break. All right. Let's take this break. We're going to take a quick break. Um, and then we're going to come back and just keep hammering through these uh, uh, fantastic questions, body related questions. Uh, we'll be right back with the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. All right, welcome back to the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored Q&A edition. All right, so we've been firing away actually quite some, some good qu uh, questions uh, from you guys regarding body and body contouring. So what do you have next? Okay, the next question comes from Rachel underscore Schultz. Rachel underscore Schultz. How much help do you recommend when having a tummy tuck? Great question. So 99% of surgeons I know love to underestimate post-operative care. Love it. How's, how, how's the breast organ? Oh, you won't feel any pain. You're gonna be amazing. You're gonna do great. Actually, you can play tennis in two days. Why? Because when you tell a patient that the recovery is easy, they are likely to book. And then they're in the aftermath and like, oh my God, I'm an outlier. I'm in so much pain. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we just cut you in half. So an abdominoplasty is no different than any other surgery. You will be uncomfortable for about a week. You will need help for about a week. What kind of help? You're going to get up and you're going to need to go pee. You're going to need help. You're going to want to go back and lay in bed. You're going to need help. 
You're going to want to go for a little walk. You're going to need help. You're going to want to take a shower. Take, you're gonna need you're, help. Well, you're not going to take a shower because as you know, I don't oh, let you shower right, for right. a week, but you're going to want to yes. eat. Someone's going to help you. So you're an invalid. But you still have to bathe. You have to bathe somehow. Yeah, but, you, but my point being is you're an invalid yeah. for a week. Right. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. And while you don't need 24 hours around the clock, you need some grown adult. It could be your kid. It could be your neighbor. It could be your mom. It could be your friend. Someone around in the other room or somewhere that in case you need someone, they're like, hey, hey, Maria, can you help me? I, I just need to go to the bathroom for a second. Hey, Maria, I, I got to get up and sit in the sofa, so on and so forth. So one week of help, two weeks off work. That's the case. Otherwise, don't bother doing it. Well, I think it's important to have help. When I did the breast surgery which is nothing compared nothing to in comparison. nothing comparison. And if I didn't have my husband there helping me, brushing my teeth, doing it, I'm telling you, it was amazing. It was, I was on vacation for a week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone will hire. Maybe your husband can do an aftercare. He, he, he can hire, <laughs> hire yeah. him to come take care of you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from 789. Dash six 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 nine. Is that their social security number? I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the BMI requirement for tummy tuck lipo? Okay, so that's a great question. Yeah. So BMI or body mass that's index right. is a method of determining how overweight you are. It's more effective than just your weight. So what that means, it takes your weight and height into consideration. So if you weigh 120 pounds and you're five foot one, and someone is five foot six and weighs 120 pounds, you guys are both not the same as saying they're both 121 pounds. So mm -hmm. it's a more accurate method. Mm -hmm. And the question essentially saying is what's the right weight concentration for doing a tummy tuck? And the answer is I don't have a strict criteria and let me explain you why. I will absolutely not operate on you if you're overweight. It won't happen under no circumstance. Why? Because you will not get a great outcome you will be unhappy, mm -hmm. you will be mad at me, mm -hmm. you will go write a nasty review, and it's something we would have known from the beginning before we started. Having said that, the way people distribute their fat is very different. Mm -hmm. And I've had patients who have come to me, let's say we have two patients, they're five foot six and 145 pounds. Let's say their ideal is 130, I'm making it up, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the two of them come to me and one of them has all of her excess weight, let's say it's 15 pounds of excess weight, right in her belly, right in her gut. And there's gonna be a question coming up regarding this and I'll explain it. It's right in her abdomen and she's got th skinny thighs and skinny legs and skinny arms and just is she's otherwise- right in the center. Just right in the center. Mm -hmm. We call that an apple shape. We call that visceral fat. That is common often with men. Then that person is not gonna have a good outcome because all their fat is in their belly and they're gonna to wanna to be flat and I can't, what, I'm not a magician, I can't mm -hmm. remove that fat. Conversely, the other person who's five foot six, 145 pounds, their abdomen is all floppy and they've had kids and it's all loose. And their extra 15 pounds is in their thighs and their butt, they carry it in their arms. So I don't have a strict BMI, I certainly won't operate on you if you're overweight, but more important than the BMI is how much visceral fat or fat you have in your abdomen. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot, I don't care what weight you are, I can't hit a home run. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in a second base or a third base result. That's a, a good point. I, I lost weight just to do my breast implant, my, uh, remove my breast implant, and I felt that it would gave us more realistic yeah, well, look obviously, for my breast. Yeah, I mean, listen, in general, when you do plastic surgery, you'd like to be at a more realistic weight. That's just because you're creating a, the framework on that person. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just hitting it out of the park, you can't, you can't, you can't do an abdominal plastic on an overweight patient. Mm -hmm. it, it's, the, the tummy tuck is not meant to get rid of the, the fat. It's to tone it, right? To it's to reshape it. your abdomen right. due to excess skin and muscle disorder, not to remove fat. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one comes from Dan underscore Ellis Simeon. Okay, Dan underscore Ellis Simeon. Right. What is your technique with creating a natural looking belly button? It's my biggest fear with undergoing a tummy tuck. And by the way, if I had to do a tummy tuck, that would be my biggest fear. Yeah, so when you go on people's galleries and look at before and afters, let me back up here. Let's say you have a horrific scar. It's heinous, it's, it's oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. You can cover that at least. You can, even if it's a high scar, which is a terrible outcome, you can wear a midriff. 
But if you ever want to wear a two-piece again and you went through all this trouble, spent all this money, went through all this agony, and you want to wear a bikini or a two-piece, if you got an ugly belly button, you know, it ain't happening. And everyone who, if you go on people's galleries, doctor's galleries, and you look at their before and after, you're going to see some funky ass belly buttons. I'm talking heart shape, coin size, slit size, just sundial looking things. I mean, there are, I have a, I have a, um, I have an album in my phone that I, when I do my consults for different consults, for different consults, I have different albums. And one of them is called botched belly buttons. And I'll pull that out. So absolutely the belly button is important. And the other thing about the belly button is a telltale sign. In other words, like if it, it, there's no woman who's not going to see another woman and see her belly button, let alone another guy, see another woman and be like, oh, that, that, that's a tummy tuck, right? Because the belly button looks weird. So to answer your question, what do we do? First of all, there are a lot of steps that create a cute belly button. Number one, it's cutting the right size of the, let me explain to you how we make the belly button so you understand. We don't make you a new belly button. We don't cut off your belly button and create a new one. We don't take your belly button and move it. We don't do anything to your belly button. We cut around your belly button and leave your belly button attached to your abdomen exactly where it is. Then we move all the excess skin down, cut it off, sew up the muscles, and then make a new opening Mm -hmm. in the new skin over the old belly button and bring the old belly button out of the new skin. Because that belly button is attached to your abdomen. Correct. So your so belly button's not going anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. Right. Because I have patients. I are never like, thought of that. Patients are like, oh my God, my belly button's so much lower. Your belly button hasn't moved. <laughs> okay. Now, what's important is number one, when you cut around that belly button, you don't cut a huge circle. Two, when you make the new opening, you don't make a huge circle because these things stretch. Three, you wanna make sure that the belly button is puckered. Some people, as a result of losing weight, gaining pregnant, getting pregnant, their belly buttons, when we, when we cut around it, is long and loose. Mm -hmm. And we wanna tether it. If you look at your kid's belly button, it's tight, mm -hmm. right? When you pull on their stomach, what prevents you from moving the skin is it's attached to the belly button. So you gotta sew the belly button it, it down and make it snug so that when you bring it through the skin, it pulls and puckers the skin down. Mm. So absolutely there are techniques to make belly buttons natural looking versus ugly, nasty belly buttons. And I do agree that it's, it's, it's a big problem. Oh my God, I would, I would be petrified if that coming out bad. Next, uh, this one comes from Elizabeth Groschel. Elizabeth Groschel, Groschel. okay. And her question is, how does having visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat affect the outcome of a tummy tuck? That's why I told you this was, that's, this is probably the best question that anyone's ever answered, uh, uh, asked. Because going back to that BMI comment, at the end of the day, what are we doing with a tummy tuck? Mm -hmm. We are not removing any fat except for the fat that's attached to the skin that gets removed. A tummy tuck, the ideal candidate for a tummy tuck is an individual who's lost as much weight as they can. They have a bunch of loose skin above and below their belly button. And as a result of having kids or not having kids, they have a protuberance to their belly that is not due to being fat, but rather flaccidity or flaccidness to their muscles. Mm -hmm. When the inside, so fat, we carry fat, what she's referring to is visceral versus subcutaneous. Right. Subcutaneous means I can grab it. I literally right. can put my hands on it and grab it. Right. That is technically accessible to liposuction. You can, mm -hmm. you can liposuction it. Visceral means inside your, your viscera, organs. which okay. means around your organs. organs. And usually we say men are apple-shaped, women are pear-shaped. Women carry fat and excess weight in their thighs and hips and butt. Men carry fat in their abdomen. While that is generally the case, not always the case, there are many women that carry their fat, five pounds, 20 pounds, viscerally. When your fat is viscerally, I can't remove it. And when I go to flatten you, not remove your skin, flatten you, that fat is in the way. And you're asking someone to shut a closet door with a washing machine in it. You must lose the weight on your own. There's no liposuction on your own until your belly becomes floppy mm -hmm. and evacuated. Then a surgeon can tighten up the muscles and flatten you. 
But with visceral fat, you will never, never get a nice outcome. What you'll be is protuberant and barrel shaped, like round mm -hmm. and stiff, even after the tummy tuck. Wow. Well, that's it. That's it? We asked all the questions regarding tummy tucks. All right. You guys did a kick-ass job. I'm actually very proud of you. Excellent questions. All right. Well, that wraps up yet another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as we did. Um, as always, I always have my two final parting requests. Number one, if you like the show, you enjoy it, it's fascinating or educational, go write something nice. It really does make um, everybody excited and likes to do work on the podcast. And secondly, share the podcast with people you love, people you know, people you care about. You just will never know when that person's gonna go do something and it'll be too late. And you wanna arm them with as much information before they have the procedure, not after. All right. As always, muchas gracias, Maria from Miami. From Miami. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Until next week, I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Raban, signing off on Plastic Surgery Uncensored.